Uh, thank you for that uh, very nice welcome. Um, OK. Uh, my colleague, Jean Hillier, who's the co-author of the book that's on the screen, was here a couple of years ago. And uh, I think in the introduction, because uh, Jean had about 10 books up on, on, on the wall, and I've only got the one, was how, how can you talk about planning in 10 words uh, uh, when you had written all those books? There were words to that effect, I think, the introduction went. Well, I'm going to try and talk about planning in a few more than 10, 10 words myself. But it's really, as, as the cover of the book, has a picture of a modernized version of, of, of the Tower of Babel, because it's actually what drives all discourses, scientific or otherwise, of really language. Um, whenever I come to Europe, and I come virtually every year because I really enjoy going to the Association of uh, European Planning Schools annual conference, it always kind, kind of interests me that the, the, the program for the conference is, is um, called the scientific program. Because in my part of the world, planning and public policy is if it's considered in any category, it's actually considered a humanity. It's actually not considered science. And it's interesting how different terminology gets used in, in different ways. And to borrow this uh, quote uh, 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 for, uh, about Foucault, about the regimes of truth. And very much in Europe, the regime of, of truth is about, it's a form of scientific discourse. But in other parts of the world, it's a little bit different. And if, if I take on the, on the point of view of one uh, European philosopher from the middle part of the last century, Karl Popper, who was very critical to have a very quite narrow definition of what science is about. And he said, science, something can only be considered a science if it passes the test of falsification. A subject can only, you know, has to be considered, make risky predictions that can actually be, go out and be tested. And the, the exemplar that he used was Einstein, who in, I think in 1915 had the general theory of relativity. And among other things that it predicted was that gravity bends light. And he not only uh, 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 theorized that gravity bend, bent light, but he actually had a formula for how much it would bend it. And shortly after this came out, I'm not sure if it was Einstein or, or another bright spark, said, I can see a way of testing that, but we need an eclipse of the sun. And so a couple of years later, when the next solar eclipse happened, they measured it, and sure enough, the lights from other stars got bent around the sun, exactly as Einstein predicted. So it passed the test of falsification. Therefore, Einstein's physics was very much scientific. But at the same time, you know, planning and its theorization, the planning theory, seldom would, I, I suspect, pass uh, Popper's test, because at, at best, we don't make risky predictions. Or the closest we make in planning to risky predictions is prescriptions of the plans that we've prescribed. And is that really scientific? Particularly because many plans go for 20 or 30 or 40 years, but the reality is within five or 10 years, there's always a new plan. So the duration of the plan very seldom gets played out. Further, in this lecture, I wish to put forward a, 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 a theoretical approach with which Popper used as an exemplar of something that was an untestable theory, therefore not science, and he used two examples, one of which was Marxist science, writing about it 50 years ago. And of course, we wouldn't consider that science today, but the other exemplar that he used was Freud and psychoanalysis. It cannot be science, and of course it can't be, because you can't make predictions about the individual unconscious. It doesn't work. But I'm going to draw on that in, in what I'm talking about today, because it's, it's the crux of what I do in my research. Uh, but I'm going to draw not on Freud directly, but on one of his successors, uh, 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 Jacques Lacan, a post-Freudian psychoanalyst theorizer, and basically that guy. And that's what I want to talk about today. I and others contend that the discourses and narratives that drive planning are often about or inspired by powerful memories, deep fears, passionate hopes, intense angers, and visionary dreams. You know, it's what we get a motive about. These emotive stories affect and shape our attention as to what's important in planning and other things in the public realm. And, and it tells us what requires our collective action. Uh, and these are driven by really strong feelings. And that's what largely drives the agency of planning, I suggest. As Kristeva observes, it's the emotive dramas of subjectivity, identity, and personal desires that give rise and cause our strongest actions that induce societal deviance, revolt, and change. And planning is about 
changing for a better future, one way or the other. Yet, and the critique of science, that the Cartesian worldview of science uh, is only concerned about reasoned rationality derived from measurable perception, classical positivism, if you will, and that that's the only regime of truth in Europe, then I suggest that it's a truth that is best is rather simplistic and naive, at least for understanding planning, at least in the very narrow definition of science. Of course, there can be bony definitions, I suppose, but I'm going to stick with that narrow definition in my critique today. So if planning is largely driven by collective desires and fears, then how can you understand it? I suggest that these subjective emotive concepts are largely entangled with planning through our collective use of language, hence the Tower of Babel at the start of the lecture. The most appropriate word to capture this process of entanglement is the term ideology. And I contend after Reed and uh, on David Harvey that planning is largely an ideological activity that attempts to shape and codify their plans and related policy, what ought to be, and of polities, i.e. of communities, a future. I suggest that planning, especially spatial strategic planning, is all about collective wish fulfillment and desire, what we want our cities and towns to be like. My critical question then is, how then does this process work? I contend to understand the ideological, emotional dimensions of planning requires an understanding of the subject, basically the human subject, but you don't call it human normally. Um, one that considers both what its subject can assert in language and what cannot be fully articulated, what you can't put into words. This letter includes the subject's conscious, but importantly, their unconscious fears and desires. And you say, what fears and, and desires are unconscious? Where does that come from? And I want to talk about that a little bit today. And the way I want to do that is through this guy, Jack Lacan, because he's particularly concerned about fear and desire and how the subject, the human subject, relates to others within and through language and what can't get related through language and the confusion that creates. Lacanian derived theory explains how knowledges and their labeling signifiers Words like sustainability, livability, resilience, et cetera, that captures a whole bunch of different discourses, are taken to heart, to unconscious heart by the planner, and then prescribed onto the planned public, essentially, as I would put it, put it as magic things. I have these magic solutions. I'll make you the most livable city in the world. You can possibly not want that. I contend that these knowledges are largely utterances of fantasy and desire ideological belief that is certain include emotive rhetoric as to what is wanted rather than being statements only derived from or asserting empirical fact as scientific tested knowledge. So often, even in my part of the world, we might claim it's a scientific fact, but it's not. It's addressing, it's like, you know, the, the, the naked emperor walking through town, everyone saying how wonderful it is, to the little kid says, but he's got no clothes on. And I think science, at least in my part of the world, is used as a dressing to justify things that aren't particular science at all. Lacanian theory, theoretical insight provides an explanation as to why actors in the urban policy formation often act as they do, and in particular how and why these actors gain, importantly, identification with particular beliefs, values, and desires as to what the future city ought to be. And this includes in the, pa the past and the future. Le Cabousier's had a bunch of fantasies of what the city should be like, and we're still paying the price recovering from that 50, 60 years on. And you know, what are the fantasies for the future? You know, again, is there science really being applied there? Or is it just simply wish fulfillment being applied? So going back to Lacan, who is this guy? Uh, he's, you know, well, the French consider him kind of important in the mid-60s. There's a famous cartoon of this guy called Foucault, which you guys probably all know who he is. There's Lacan. Anyone tell me who that guy is? Starts with an S. Sartre, yeah. And this guy? Ingl uh, literature? Barth, yeah, Roland Barth, yeah. So, you know, they're, they're, they're all kind of sitting around with some kind of anthropological kind of discussion. But anyhow, where Lacan comes from, Freud, obviously. This guy, the father of, 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 of European linguistics. Heidegger, uh, the German philosopher. There's a dash of Hegel through French interpretations, all coming together. And what Lacan's doing, largely 
as a clinical psychoanalyst, trying to make sense of how we engage with language. And that's been rearticulated through different ways since uh, and, 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 and used by other, other theorists or philosophers like Zizek, who I gather was a visitor here a couple of years ago, uh, uh, to actually talk and engage with modern contemporary globalized world. So central to Lacanian theorizing is the insight that while the human subject or society can't exist without language, neither the subject nor the material world can be diminished to the symbolic alone. There's something more than what we can put into words. Some type of symbolic structure or system is critical in which to construct our perception of social reality. You know, what the world around us is all done through language. Go away, you. Uh, uh, but the relationships between structure and agency within our social reality is often obscure. For these relationships extend to a dimension indeterminate to language or even to that of our imaginations. There's something else out there that makes us, motivates us to do things. Symbolic and or images might be able to describe much about structure, but it can't explain agency. What motivates us to do things? What drives us? And Lacan calls this indeterminate dimension, the real, which resides completely external to that of the symbolic or the imaginary. Here's a couple of pictures. You know, this is what? The Mobius strip is what it's called in English. It's only got one side. How can you explain that? You fall it around, you're on the same side. How can you contextualize or explain that? I assume most of you, because Paris isn't that far away, have seen the Mona Lisa. How would you describe the smile? You can't put it into words. It's outside of words. These are metaphors that I'm using to, to engage with the real. But they're, 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 they're aspects of what I'm trying to get to. The real, that which we can't articulate or even get our heads around. But it's somehow there. It's nickeling at us. It's irritating us. Yet we can't put our fingers on it or explain it. And it's in that realm that's outside of language that we discount heavily from uh, Cartesian or other forms of science because you can't measure it, so you ignore it. But I'd say, or Lacan would say, and I agree with him, that it's there. There are these dimensions. And they really reside with way, what underlying a motivation. At best, we deploy fantasy and illusion to obscure this impossible thing. It's a nomenum in contrast to a phenomenon that exists but cannot be symbolized or even visualized. The real is a lack in the symbolic that provokes subject to produce an imaginary element to obscure what is lacking and give some type of consistency to what cannot be signified within language. Hence, what ensures the possibility of the coherent appearing social reality is basically fantasy, especially the manner in which fantasy screens over the void, lack, or absence of the real. What we can't quite put our finger on, but it's irritating us. So we create a fantasy. And if you think about social strife, if you think about your anger to your professor for getting that lousy mark, you can't put all that into words. And that's aspects of maybe a constructive fantasy about why he's such a hard marker. It's that the kind of thing I'm talking about. For a, in Lacan the, Lacanian theory, social reality's very ontological consistency implies a certain non-knowledge of the participants. Accordingly, uh, social reality can be largely constituted as a set of ideological fantasies that we generally desire and accept uncritically once suggested to make our existence more understandable and less painful while blindly overlooking what is lacking. It's a bit like an impressionist painting, uh, provided you don't look at it too closely. Can anyone see the industrial foreshore in the background here? It gets really clear once it's pointed out, but until it's pointed out, it's really hard to see, right? Did anyone notice that only when I pointed that out? Or was it visible right from the start? Yeah? OK. Maybe it was. Sometimes it worked. It depends on the graphic of, of the projector. So Lacanian theorizing suggests that lack and the fantasies that we devise to cover it acts as a key focal point for particularly political debate. You know, if you want to be a good politician, you say there's a problem. There's, we're lacking something. Nijmegen would be a better city if only. Or there's a problem. There's a problem in Nijmegen. It's detracting from being the city that should be one of the dominant cities in, in the Netherlands. But it's not because there's a problem. There's something missing, something that needs resolution. Once established in governance, this lack is filled by a policy solution, a wish-fulfilling fantasy, so that this filling function of the proposed policy provides the appearance of a more or less coherent whole to a polity. My city in Auckland, New Zealand, 
purportedly lacks competitive fitness in the global economy. From a geographical perspective, it's stopped in the middle of a, you know, thousands of kilometers from the nearest markets and a, and a, and a, and a population of four and a half million. It makes no sense economically. But it's okay, it's a problem. You know, Auckland will fix it. The policy prescription there is to make Auckland the most livable city in the world. Hey, well, it doesn't really match, you know, global fitness or global comp competitiveness, but hey, something's being done. So the people are happy, creating the world's most livable city. And of course, you know, how are you gonna do that? That doesn't matter. It's creating this wish fulfillment. It's the planning policy, the core planning policy for the whole metropolitan region of one and a half million people is to make it the most livable city in the world. Yeah, believe that. I've got some bridges for sale. You know, nice uh, New Zealand bridge, really good price. Yeah. Okay, for, for Lacan, the subject is inherently separated between the symbolic real realm of conscious understanding, including a sense of self that we share with others in society, and divided split from the ability to articulate or even understand our own unconscious self and our often strange drives and desires. How then are we able to understand the unconscious desires of others that we generally try and please so as to be wanted them, uh, by them, unless you're a psychopath, including what's ca called in Lacanian jargon, the big other, which is basically the symbolic order, society, culture, all others. And uh, Lacan actually talked about it in this, what he called the L schema or the Lambda schema about the uh, idea of the subject and the, and, and the ego, the relation to the other. And to simplistically explain that, I'll talk about that briefly now. And of course, all this is there, and we can't really answer it, but that's where ideology and fantasy flour flourishes, because of this inconsistency of the unconscious and being able to understand it, not only for ourselves, but for the other people that we're trying to please. In Lacanian theory, the conscious ego is literally a self-construct, initially arising in relationship to the infant's body, perception of the external world. Little kids, you know, screaming little kids. This is a conscious subjectively captured by symbolic language as a young child learns to articulate its needs. You take language. If you want something as a little screaming infant, all you can do is cry, so you gradually assimilate yourself into language. You adapt yourself to a language that's already there. So you can tell mom, hey, I, I want, would like some orange juice, please. As a consequence of language being imposed on us by our integration into culture, the conscious ego ideal is bared and or split from understanding its own unconscious subjectivity and desires. You know, little kids, screams. You know, it's an emotive thing, screaming, directly related to the unconscious, what it wants. Suddenly you get language that's a conscious thing and doesn't relate to what's driving you to scream. But you still have to, you can't scream anymore, and you gotta put it into words. There's a disconnect, there's a split there. For Lacan, the root of uh, psychological conflict is a radical incommensurability between the biological human organism, we're all human animals, that's all we are. And yet we have this socially, linguistically constructed human subject sitting on top of our consciousness based in language, uh, you know, separating us apart. Lacan defines the split subject as a stance or position adopted in relation to the other's unknowable desire, originally that of the infant to the mum, insofar as the desire ro arises the subject arouses the subject's own desire. It's all about desire, wanting mum initially, and as we grow up, that's morphed into other desires and other wants, other, other, other relationships. The subject ad adopts a stance against the traumatic encounter with the other's desire as a primordial experience of pleasure pain. Originally ourselves, as terrified infants screaming for the unfulfilled desire of nonstop wholeness provided by our primordial experience of mum's milk and security. It's our most fundamental thing. When we're born, we want mom. We want to be whole with mom, right? And of course, we're all adults. We don't think of that anymore. But metaphor more metaphorically and metronomically, that's still there and it's, more, it's slipped and still drives us fundamentally. The lack of wholeness induced by our first separations from mom's security is the most fundamental unconscious psychic trauma. Yet, uh, as we grow up, a return to this maternal bliss is never possible. What is only created is an unconscious fundamental fantasy that somehow this wound or lack can be resolved. So, uh, that we can again be a whole subject, safe and secure with mum. From this follows the fantasy or belief that there must be some sovereign good that is capable of shielding us from the terror of living, just like mum used to do. And this tends to underlie and give substance to the imaginary fantasies that help construct our social reality. 
you know, substitute for mom. For Lacan, the subject comes into the form of attraction towards and defense against the primordial, overwhelming experience of mom's laws, which Lacan terms jouissance. And for those that speak French, you know what that means. It's about bodily enjoyment. But Lacan uses this in a much more extended kind of way. For Lacan, jouissance is a seeking of enjoyment that transcends the pleasure principle into what Freud refers to as a death drive. Think of a little infant screaming his head off for mom just to be whole. You know, and the mom comes. The two get interlinked. The screaming, the pain, the anxiety gets interlinked with the wholeness and love. So the two are mixed. So jouissance goes beyond pleasantness to something that's destructive and painful because the initial experiences are kind of folded and, 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 and conflicting together uh, as little infants. In this pre-symbolic realm of joyousness and the ongoing uh, trauma of separation from mom, with an inherent terror of the possible loss of mom's love, our most fundamental desires for completeness and whole are, are, are constituted a seeking that forever resides in our unconscious, ever split and barred from direct conscious awareness by our symbolic self. Human development entering into language and socialization uh, uh, that is uh, uh, having a place in the symbolic network comes at a cost to its participants, the cost of displacing jouissance and the very conscious desire for jouissance. We can't be childish. We have to be ordered and correct and follow the rules. And that is displacing the jouissance. Hence, jouissance is the basic drive to achieve perpetual satisfaction, therefore close the gap of separation, the fundamental wound that constitutes the lacking subject. Yet a return to our primordial eternal bliss is never possible. What it only creates are, is the unconscious fundamental fantasy that this wound can be resolved so that we can again be a whole subject. You know, it's impossibility, but it's what we desire. I repeat, because this is really important, from this follows that there must be something capable of shielding us from the terror of living, just like mom used to do. And this gives substance to the fantasies that help construct our desired social reality. This includes the appearances of partial wholeness that planning provides of the desired city to be, as laid out in the spatial or whatever plan. A plan promising a set of stabilizing fantasies that promises a future of contentment, which will allow subjects to achieve harmony and stability above all certainty. There's nothing scary. We're all safe because it's being planned in a safe city, the most lovable city in the world, to use my example. So how does this all work through ideology? The functions of desirous uh, uh, language uh, uh, in pinning the subject to culture, how ideology is constructed and work. Identifications with a range of master signifiers constitutes the subject as an individual in culture and society. You know, we all have a bunch of attributes. I'm a man, I'm, I've got a Canadian speech impediment, I live in New Zealand. Those are all at master signifying attributes. To be a New Zealander has a whole set of beliefs and knowledges. To be a man has a whole set of beliefs and knowledges and values that you're supposed to follow. These all help define us, but we summarize those into key master words or key signifiers. These signifiers include signifiers of bodily appearance, ethnicity, gender, through to more abstract signifiers of our intellectual and spiritual beliefs. The totality of our master signifiers constitutes the subject's ego ideal, ego ideal, what the ego is, at least in Lacanian psychoanalysis, which comprises the core beliefs, values, and a sense of self produced in who at least we believe we are and can express in the symbolic, symbolic realm constituting social reality. It's how we present ourselves in the symbolic world. Master signifiers permit us to amicably arrange and clearly communicate our descriptive as well as abstract identifications. E.g., I'm a white male liberal cyclist. Not really. I'm certainly not into flower arrangement, but you get the drift. It's how someone can describe themselves. Master signifiers are crucial for supporting uh, are sorting out our sense of self and society's complex sea of conflicting and contradicting knowledges, beliefs, and values. It's who you are. It's who you can say you are. You know, if you don't, if, if, if you don't have enough uh, identifications, uh, you, you're driven to psych psychotic madness. Or if you've got too many, you just don't know how to act. You're in neurotic despair, to use some, some kind of classic psychoanalytical concepts. Masses signifiers allow us to identify with others in our life worlds. Hey, I'm a planner. Some of you in the rooms are planners. I'm not a geographer, but if I was a, I, I was a geographer, I'd say, hey, I'm a geographer. You're geographers. Hey, we have this common interest. We share a master signifier. To be a geographer has a whole set of values, norms, beliefs, values. 
but we all codified that under the one word geographer, right? It's one of our identification. It's, uh, it's a way that we identify ourselves. And it allows us to form our diverse groups and communities of interest. They al master signifiers allow us to have shared harmonious social identifications, while at the same time allowing us to accommodate difference and disagreement within across each identification. You know, you can be a, 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 a human geographer, you can be a uh, well, the economy, uh, economic geographer, you can have a whole bunch of different ways of being a geographer. Um, you know, but these identifications constitute who we are and our groups are. Master signifiers constitute the structuralization of the social political life. They are who we are and what we believe and what we can put into words. And we go out and we demonstrate and we argue and we fight for those important things. We have a sense of identity and belief and we support that. As we feel strongly about our identifications, we tend to strongly defend our master signifiers to others. Yet master signifiers are empty signifiers without explicit meaning. Uh, you know, going back to linguistics, there's two sides to every signifier. There's what, what it means and how it's signified. They're like a, a signifier, it's like an empty cup. You can put a whole bunch of different meanings in there and fill it up. Think of, you know, the word like geographer. You know, there's a whole range of geographers out there, but you're all fit in the cup of being geographers. Or if you're a planner for the planners in the room, there's a whole range of different types of planning. And, and they all, so we can all call ourselves planners, but there's a whole bunch of different knowledges and, and identifications we can put in that empty cup. Master signifiers tied together model various and often styled muddled and conflicting arrays of knowledges. Academic or cultural, which may or may not, also comprise other master signifiers under one universal and iconic signifier. You know, common words, democracy, freedom, the middle class. Everyone middle class in this room? Yeah, it's a whole set of values to be middle class, uh, but it holds a lot of different meanings to also in being middle class. Independence, capitalism are all master signifiers, each with many desirous and contested meanings as well as contestable fantasies of what they mean, and what they allow, and what they desire. Lacan calls these master signifiers point to capital, my, my French is atrocious, but in ties, like the things that pin down that couch, literally, top things from sliding around. Each master signifier is a nodal point which quilts and pins sets of knowledges, beliefs and practices, stops them sliding and fixes their meaning. Each provides an anchoring point or a con or concise signifying label Label is the key word for a whole field and by embodying it effectuates its identity and allows you to identify with it. What constitutes a signifier as a suturing mass of signifier is that it's isolated from all the knowledges that it contains. Uh, while the mass of signifiers remains unchanged, their descriptive features will be uh, fundamentally unstable and open to all kinds of hegemonic rearticulations. For example, desirable planning words like sustainability are things like sustainability, resilience, or livability. Each have many contested interpretations, but the labels sustainability, resilience, or livability themselves don't change. They're pinned down, anchored, bang, sustainability, even though there's tons of different meanings, interpretations that underlie it. But we all can say we're sustainable, and that can mean a whole bunch of different things but we're all sustainable, so we can all share that identification, right? Massive signifiers uh, related to urban planning and, and, and engendered contemporary political discussions and uh, uh, policy discussions include public good, market forces, globalization, democracy, smart growth, blah, 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 blah. Uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, you know, and the, that inventory isn't comprehensive. There's a whole bunch of other ones, but they're all key words that particularly the profession of planning uses. These empty signifiers have given up specific explicit meaning uh, to secure a whole bunch of different points of view or unique interpretations pertaining to particular situations under their one label, right? Which view dominates, if any, is largely a matter of politics and power, hence the term hege hegemony and go back to Foucault, power knowledge, et cetera. But, there's a, th but that's a really another lecture I can't get into at this time, though I'll touch on it briefly a little bit later on. But what's fundamentally important is that planning narratives and the master signifiers that stop them, pins them down, stops them sliding about, are fundamentally ideological. These ideological fictions 
construct social reality itself. It simplifies the complex world. So we can use these labels to communicate, but they're fuzzy, ambiguous, hence very ideological. <coughs> Kant calls these undefinable concepts transcendental ideas. They're beyond human knowledge and experience. However, according to Zizek, if we reject these illusions and fantasies, we lose reality itself. The moment we subtract fictions from reality, reality itself loses its discursive logical consistency. Things that paper together and make it seem whole disintegrate, and it falls apart. So I'll talk about planning here. So you know, geographers can be very critical of this is, uh, if you're not a planner. Uh, you know, planning is a group identity of shared mysteries. You know, the old, you know, uh, 500 years ago in, in a city, if you, if you got into a guild, you were induced into the mysteries of that guild. It's the same today in the modern professions of planning. It's probably the same in geography. You're induced into the mysteries. The planning profession is, uh, is constituted by a membership of similarly minded but not always agreeing practitioners. All human disciplines or professions distinguish themselves through the shared use of technical terms, or which are really master signifiers, whose definition is often ambiguous, difficult to learn, and hence providing, importantly, for professions like planning, barriers to admittance, because you have to know how to use the terms, and are always changing and or evolving for the practitioners involved. Each profession recognizes itself through the common use of some jargon-laden expressions whose meaning is not clear to anyone. Everyone refers to them, and what binds the group together is ultimately their shared ignorance. No one knows what the words mean, but they use them all the time. In Planning's case, these are terms, as we talked about, sustainability, smart growth, resilience, new urbanism, urban containment, the public interest, or even planning itself. I talk to my planning students and say, can you define planning? And people mumble around and say, you really can't, can you? That's because it's an empty signifier. It means whatever you want it to mean. That's one of the problems the discipline actually has. So, you know, anyone tell me, uh, define sustainable city? Anyone want to volunteer a definition of what a sustainable city or a most livable, uh, even, a lo uh, even just a livable city? Anyone define that? Of course you can't because they're, you know, empty words. But I imagine even, even in geography, a large part of the education <laughs> is about sustainable development and sustainable principles. Well, resilience is one of the newest empty words that come out. And I bet you spend a lot of time talking about if you're doing climate change or adaptation. Uh, 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 resilience, but it's, uh, it's getting to the point, as I think Libby Porter in, in a recent article is, is using it as uh, saying, yes, it's another empty signifier. It can mean whatever you want it, largely want it to mean. Indeed, what ensures the discipline's homogeneity, singleness, are specific professional master signifiers whose meanings are actually a mystery to all its practitioners. People are induced into the mysteries, but there's still mysteries after being in inducted into them. No one knows what they really concisely mean, but everyone assumes that the others in the group do. So we go on using it all the time, and no one expresses its ignorance, but I really don't know what sustainability means, unless you're very brave. Special effect here, just don't say I don't spoil you, because everyone else assumes that the others in the group do. Consequently, they have to be the real thing, and so everyone uses them constantly. A master signifier is most effective when or where it appears mysterious, nonsensical, incomplete, not only to us, but even to everyone else, to the other. For it's, it's just this that allows it to be open up to us, allows us to add to it, make it our own. It is just in a uh, just in its lack and unknowability that calls upon us to realize it, take its place, say what it should be saying. We can, tell, we can say what it means. Of course we can't, but we think we can. So we adopt it. We, we buy into it. We use it. It becomes really important to us. So let's look at one example, and, and, and uh, one of your colleagues suggested we look at, because a lot of large part of the world's sustainability is kind of getting to be an old world word now, replaced largely by resilience, but it's still largely a, 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 a massive signifier of ideological magic, I, I gather, or so I've been told, in the Netherlands. The label sustainability is, is used in a manner that Anne Marcuson refers to as a fuzzy concept, not talking about Lacan or anyone, just in general about why no one can, everyone uses sustainability, writing about it scientifically, but no one, they, they, they use it, and it means different things to everyone talking about it. 
It's a fuzzy concept which posits, uh, 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 you know, uh, a fuzzy concept is one which posits an entity uh, phenomena or process which possesses two or more alternative meanings and multiple meanings and thus cannot be readily identified or applied by different readers or scholars. In a, in a literature framed by fuzzy concepts, researchers may believe that they're addressing the same phenomena, but they may actually be targeting quite different ones, but they think they're talking about the same thing. Again, every, you know, it's that confusion that arises. Sustainability is a concept that everyone reports to intuitively understand, but somehow finds very difficult to operationalize into concrete terms. Regardless of the, for the last decade or more, no planning or policy document can omit the concept because sustainability, or particularly sustainable development, is declared as the ultimate planning goal, although it's not usually spe uh, specified what it exact means exactly or how it should be uh, achieved. Consequently, the success of the sustainable ideal is due especially to its unifying promise, the way it seems to transcend ideological values of the past. But it doesn't provide any kind of values of the future either, perhaps. Practitioners and academics teaching the subject don't really know exactly what the term means. They largely just retain a belief, or I might even hazard to say, a faith that they are a good thing, that we have to develop more knowledge about, hence the perceived value of academic research. But it's knowledge about a thing of faith, largely. This is especially the case for planning, which is largely an ethical project, I'd argue, not a scientific one, as to what ought to be in the future. How do you apply science, which is about epistemology, about facts, to what should be in the future? You know, it's a difficulty there. For planning, these especially include the mass of signifiers, the ones I talked about before, public good, now sustainability. You know, before sustainability came around, the big word in planning was, we're doing this for the public good. It was the ideology where you have to allow us to do this in the name of the public good. It was the holy grail. That's kind of fallen by the wayside now. Now we, you have to allow us to do this in the name of sustainability. Or maybe in the new emerging, you have to allow us to do this in the name of resilience. You do want a resilient city against climate change, don't you? You know, et cetera. And not to mention all the other ones. So plan, plan, planners regularly use these terms often as justification for the professional actions. E.g., we must do this, et cetera, just as I said, uh, for sustainable cities, sustainable transport, or sustainable practice, or sustainable, you fill in whatever blank you want because the sustainability gives magic power to whatever you're trying to do. Yet what unites planners and other professions as a discipline is fundamentally their common or shared lack of knowledge about what it actually means. No one knows, yet alone can succinctly or comprehensively and universally define what a sustainable city or a livable city for that matter actually is. However, they allow us to construct our planning fantasies as to what a desirous, sustainable, perhaps livable city might be. You know, it's fantasy construction. At best, we can only guess towards some vague notion of sustainability that lacks a clear focus. But it's this lack of clarity that allows this mass signifier to be the good thing. For, those of, uh, for everyone that embraces it, regardless of the particularity of their individual understandings, dreams, and illusions about the, this sublime, sublime object, sublime, you know, beyond beauty, terrifyingly beautiful object, which make it profoundly ideological in its very ontological nature. It's the real thing. And particularly if you're a planner, it's the real thing. And you can't be a good planner in this day and age if you don't support sustainability. So you better, and importantly, even if you know that in your heart you don't really buy into sustainability, you know a good planner is supposed to buy into sustainability. So publicly, because you want to be perceived as a good planner, even if you don't believe, you publicly fake it. You know, you might have driven, you might have driven to the meeting uh, uh, in, in your private car, and you happen to have, you know, a nice turbocharged two-liter engine. Yeah, but, but you know, so so much. But you talk about the global footprint. You talk about the need for public transit and bicycles. Why they're so important in the meeting? Because that's what good planners are supposed to talk about. Even though after the meeting you hop back in your turbocharged two-liter uh, uh, wh whatever and, and shoot off into the sunset at 150 k's an hour, you know. But you fake it because that's what a good planner, a good member of that discipline, is supposed to do. And that's how you materialize ideology. Right. So the value of sustainability uh, to, to planning's conceptualization of social reality. Well, it's perhaps sometimes not straightforward to defend planning for those of planning. You know, plan, we planners, we get a lot of, lot of heavy stuff. You know, whenever something goes wrong, it's the planner's fault. 
you know, even though the fault might be the developer, but you blame the planner, et cetera, et cetera. So it's hard to justify planning, particularly in the old days, uh, and the value of pl planning to non-planners. Uh, uh, but other master signifiers, apart from planning, are particularly easy to defend, but few, if any, members of societies would wish to dig disagree with them, and sustainability fits that bill. They're literally motherhood, you know, and, and, and sustainability, protecting the environment for future, uh, current and future generations, or however else you want to define it, is situated readily on this pedestal of unquestionable goodness for most people in society. So you just grab it and stick it into your planning thing, and this gives the, uh, uh, the word great ideal ideological power, it's magical. And anything that uh, you attach to it becomes magical as well, particularly in, in conjunction with other signifiers by its mere association. It also embodies those other concepts as good things that everyone can identify with. Now, I know this is the Netherlands, so I have to have homage to your big petrochemical company. And the, in America, they've endowed a Shell Center for Sustainability. So Shell must be a good thing, right? You know, uh, so, you know. It's multiple uses. If sustainability is unquestionably good, then sustainable cities or other sustainable ends must be good, as must be sustainable management or sustainable development, et cetera, et cetera. You can argue against sustainability and all that's associated with it. This provides great value to the current discipline of planning, particularly if sustainability is now the profession's core purpose and goal, as it has been for the last decade or so, and maybe in some places now being supplanted by resilience, but who knows. For sustainability, places planning's very identity and justification largely beyond public challenge. It gives a lot of power, a lot of mana to the profession. I'm sustainable, I rock, so you can't touch me, you know? I don't know, maybe you don't buy into that, but uh, I think a lot of planners do, and a lot of the public possibly do as well. Massive signifiers such as sustainability convert the arbitrary and conventional into the regular and natural state of the world that by which an explicit order or prescription is made to seem as though it's only the only description of, uh, of a previously existing state of affairs. These ideological markers construct social reality itself. And once identified, they appear as ideals which have always existed. Now, I, I tell my students that 20 years ago, the word sustainability was barely touched on, apart from a few disciplines like uh, environmental science or ecology. No one had only vaguely heard of the word, only 20 years ago. 30 years ago, no one had heard of the word. Uh, it's only come into existence in the life, uh, uh, lifetime of most of you. Yet, you would assume, as I tell my, or my students certainly assume, that sustainability has always been a powerful word. It's been around forever, but it hasn't. It's only really had traction in the last 10, 15 years, globally at least. Uh, planning didn't address issues of, of ecological and environmental concern, did address issues of ecological and environmental concern prior to the emergence of the signifier sustainability. You know, of course it was important, but until sustainability came along, uh, it, was, it didn't really have traction. It was the transcendence of the signifier into the role of master signifier of subject identification. People could have faith and buy into it, and it's purposeful belief that allows this field of diverse issues to coalesce, collapse around this one signifier into one unified and constituting theme of identification. I can identify, I can believe in that, I can have identity with that ethical value and mission, even if the story of sustainability 10, 15, 20 years on still remains fuzzy, ambiguous, and incomplete many years after this coalescence, right? But it's, it's there. Sustainability is a massive signifier that fixes or anchors all the competing discourses that are, uh, uh, revolve around climate change and the changing planet and everything else into this one word. It's, uh, um, you know, it, it's perceived and experienced as an unfathomable, transcendent, stable point of reference, which is nearly impossible to disagree with, uh, 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 whatever its broad remit might actually be. Without the mass the signifier, there's nothing to anchor the field. With it, it's anchored and becomes important. Everyone buys into it. People that even have no idea what sustainability means know it's a good thing. Yet, e even so, the master signifier of sustainability lacks a coherent definition beyond some undefinable plateau to meet the future needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs, whatever this actually means if you put it into quantitative, empirically measurable facts. 
Consequently, this very lack of clarity makes, uh, gives rise uh, to its considerable ideological power and value uh, to the planning discipline or any other discipline that happens to use it, and all others that act in the name of this massive signifier. Yet this isn't without a cost, because it's, you can attach anything to sustainability and use it any way you want. And sustain, sustainability's looseness is the potential for this ideal to produce un, unintentioned or even intentioned pernicious effects. And it's used by policy and government often to things that are highly unsustainable. For example, in the UK, a recent document, sustainable development means encouraging economic growth while protecting the environment and improving our quality of life, all without affecting the ability of future generations to do the same. Sounds fine, but I'm sure you know the politics of this guy, the, the, the conservative government in Britain. You know, oh, I'll use my own brackets here, but only if the latter concer uh, concerns are economically sensible and or politically usable. And admittedly, some critical commentary added by me, but see my article in, 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 in published in 2006 on sustainability. Uh, where I document what happens in the UK and other countries with the way this is deployed by government to actually privilege economic growth. And if you think about economic growth, it's the antithesis of ecological sustainability. But the two are stuck together in use. <coughs> so it's captured. So a final thought to reflect on um, at, at the end as this lecture comes to a close. Would the following be any different? Thinking about the way science is used, Maybe can science be used sometimes as an empty signifier to have multiple meanings, and it's used where uh, people identify with it and buy into it, particularly in a European context. So in that case, would this quote, if we substitute scientific for sustainable, be any different, particularly if it's deployed by pretty right-wing British politician? Sustain scientific development means encouraging economic growth or protecting environmental or improving, the ability, uh, uh, improving our quality of life, et cetera, et cetera. You know, is that really a word being used any different than the other empty signifiers I talked about tonight? But of course, that gets into another topic which will require another lecture. So thanks for listening to this one. <laughs>